Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, at this stage I'd like to um, thank you for tuning in to this Enabling Change and Innovation webinar. Today's webinar is exploring the psychology of denial and our responses to climate change. This topic was actually suggested by one of our participants about two years ago. But it does show that if you're patient, the idea that you submit through our user voice system can eventually rise to the top. Uh, and it didn't help matters that when I approached two earlier potential presenters, that they turned me down. Obviously, they weren't as brave or perhaps as knowledgeable as our presenter today, who is Zoe Leviston. So Zoe has been working as a social scientist for CSIRO since 2004. She is currently part of the Adaptive Social and Behavioural Sciences Group in CSIRO's Land and Water flagship based in Perth. So she applies social psych psychological theory to a variety of natural resource challenges, including water security, agricultural management, and resource consumption. And in 2013, so just last year, she completed her PhD in psychology at Curtin University, uh, where she was assessing the social and psychological underpinnings of behavioural actions and reactions associated with climate change. So who better to have with us here today as we tackle this somewhat sensitive topic? So Zoe, thanks for joining us today. So over to you. Okay, well let me start by just uh, with a quick apology. I am suffering from a cold at the moment. Uh, so if you hear sniffles and coughs and things like that, I do apologise. I know it can be annoying to listen to. Uh, so today, yes, as, as John introduced, I'm going to be talking about the psychology of denial and our responses to climate change. And what I hope is to give you some sort of gentle introduction to some basic psychological principles and how they're relevant to a domain like climate change. Uh, another caveat. I like to start with is to just reaffirm that I am not a climate scientist. I'm a social psychologist. I do work with climate scientists, however, generally a very nice bunch of people. But if you have questions about uh, modelling and projections, I will probably be able to answer them insufficiently. Um, so sorry about that. But let's press on anyway. So just I'll just tell you a bit more uh, about our group. So. Um, there are a bunch of other psychologists that I work with. There are resource economists, uh, human geographers, and so on. And what we're interested in, really, is human behaviour, so both individually and collectively, and how that behaviour relates to environmental sustainability issues and resource consumption. So from a disciplinary perspective, we're really concerned with understanding the underlying psychological and effective processes uh, that make people do what they do. And basically the end game is to try and identify and overcome some of those hurdles to, to behavioural change and adaptation. So really the end game is enabling or helping uh, Australian communities adapt to the extent they need to adapt to in a changing climate to ensure that their well-being is maintained. So noble and lofty goals, and sometimes we even make a fair fist of doing that. But we work across domains, so we work with farmers, we work with householders and so on, uh, water consumption we work with, but also climate change. And the data, I'm going to be presenting some of um, data from a series of national surveys that we started back in 2010. And the goal of these surveys was to really understand what's driving people's responses to climate change. And by responses, it's kind of a catch-all term for people's beliefs, what they do, what they think, how they feel, and so on. Anything that's associated, by, uh, associated with or triggered by climate change. And so each year, we survey about 5,000 people from across Australia. They complete it online. Uh, these are urban people, rural people, regional people, broadly representative of the larger Australian public. And we also managed to keep a cohort of people who have taken the survey each year. So this enables us to do some proper longitudinal statistical analysis to see how people's beliefs and opinions and behaviours fluctuate over time too. And so we're very lucky in the sense that we've now compiled what probably constitutes the biggest database of climate change attitudes uh, anywhere in the world, actually. So it's 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 a it's a we're very data rich. And so uh, that was that was interesting to see people's responses um, to um, 
John's question that he posed. And that question is one of the questions uh, that we ask in our surveys. So early on in these surveys, we give people that categorical statement and a lot of people don't like it because it forces them to choose an option um, that might not best represent their view, but choose it nonetheless they do. Now, from our latest survey, I can uh, basically conclude that the people online today are not representative of the broad Australian public. This is what we get. So this is, these are the breakdown of the 5,000 people that we surveyed earlier this year. And what you can see is a small minority, 8%, select the category, I don't think climate change is happening. Uh, a, a, an even smaller chunk of people say, I have no idea whether climate change is happening or not. And the vast majority are split along those other two options. They think that climate change is happening, but they're roughly split, split in terms of whether it's just a natural fluctuation in Earth temperatures, so just, that's an important term, I think, or whether humans are largely causing it. And that last statement is the more accurate reflection of what the scientific consensus is, that human activity is largely forcing change. Well, so what, you know, it's just an opinion. Uh, we all know the old adage, everybody has one. It doesn't really matter what people think at the end of the day. Aren't we really more interested in what people are actually doing? So to this end, what we also included in our survey is a long list of activities that have relevance for people's greenhouse gas emissions at an individual level. And we asked them whether they engage in this activity, and if so, is it for environmental reasons or other reasons? And so we have activities that hardly anybody says they do. So we have very few respondents that say they have a vegetarian or vegan diet or taken part in a political campaign about an environmental issue through to, um, through to activities that a fair number of people do, like a lot of people are growing a lot of their own vegetables now, buying cleaning products that are environmentally friendly, way up to activities that nearly everybody that we survey says they do, recycling household waste, switching lights off around the house whenever possible. And what we're able to do with this list of activities is compile a, a, an environmental behaviour score for each person. So we just tot up the number of people, uh, the number of activities these people are engaged in. Now if we look at this environmental behaviour score by those categories, we find a very clear association between what people think causes climate change and how many activities people do. Uh, and it's in the way that you intuitively might expect. So people who think that human activity is driving climate change are far more likely to engage in a greater number of those emission reducing behaviours than people who don't think it's happening at all, who don't know or think that it's happening but solely natural. Uh, it's also linked to people's policy acceptance as well. Um, so we can conclude from this that opinions are important because they are heavily associated with what people do. So when we ask people this, if we're thinking like a social psychologist, we're going, well, there's probably a series of questions that people ask themselves when coming to a conclusion about um, a decision about which box to tick. Uh, and those questions might be explicitly asked. You might even ask them out loud in your head, or they might happen at a more automated subconscious level. Uh, so these processes occur in everybody. Everybody implicitly asks themselves, even psychologists, and that can form um, uh, a decision about an opinion. Now, one of the questions that most comes to mind as top of mind is, what does the evidence tell me? If I'm wondering what I think about climate change and what causes climate change, uh, I'm going to think of all the evidence that comes to mind. Now this would be nice if this is the only thing that everybody asks themselves any time that they have to make a decision about something. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, biophysical scientists often tend to fall into the trap of thinking this is the only criterion by which people make their decisions. People are rational, uh, evidence-based reasoners. Uh, that would be lovely. Uh, but we have a, a lot of mounting evidence to say it's just not sufficient. So this is, 
This is along the lines of a knowledge deficit approach. And the knowledge deficit approach assumes that if only people knew more about the climate science and understood science in general a bit better, then we wouldn't have this divisive debate about the causes of climate change. There'd be no one in that red group and very few people in that grey group as well. I'm going to pinch somebody else's work here to demonstrate one reason that this doesn't kind of bear up um, to, to the numbers. So this is work from Dan Cahan over in the States who took two groups of people. He, he identified a group of people who scored very low on science literacy and numeracy. And he grabbed another group of people who scored really highly on science literacy and numeracy. And he compared their rated risk perception of climate change. And you can see in that top right hand corner that the high group, the high literacy group, actually perceived less threat from climate change than the low literacy group. He then thought, well, there's something more going on here, and I reckon it's about cultural values. And so he measured their values and broke them into two more groups, those who had more egalitarian communitarian values and those who had more, as he termed it, hierarchical individualist uh, values, and then compared the groups on their risk perception. And he found the difference was being driven by these deeper seated values. And actually, at the high end of literacy, those values were polarizing people's responses. So it's not necessarily a, a knowledge deficit that we're dealing with. Um, and this suggests to us that simply asking a question about um, your opinion on the causes of climate change is having other functions. And as we start to interrogate the data to other questions a bit more, we see what psychologists term conflict of accounts emerging. So a further question that we ask, straight, um, a couple of questions after that categorical statement, is how much do you think human activity contributes to climate change as a percentage of overall climate change? So they had a little tog uh, they had a little a switch that they could toggle anywhere between 0%. I don't think human activity co contributes anything to climate change, right up to 100%. All of climate change is attributable to human activity. So on average, overall, our 5,000 respondents said, I think that, that uh, human activity accounts for 61.5% of all the changes we see in the climate, which is quite a lot. Uh, but then if we break it down by our groups or teams, we can see that those people, which includes 94% of you guys, on average uh, said that about 80% of the changes in our climate were attributable to human activity. So that's OK. There's no conflict of accounts there. That's fine. If we have the grey group who, remember, selected, I think that climate change is happening, but it's just a natural fluctuation in Earth's temperatures, on average, these guys said that nearly 50% of climate change is attributable to human activity. And if we actually look at the distribution of these guys, so accounting for about 1,200 of our 5,000 respondents, a large proportion of those people selected over 50% on this scale, which conflicts logically with their statement of opinion about the causes of climate change. The people who don't know, well, that doesn't really tell us much. They're probably hedging their bets and keeping the market towards the middle. And most interesting, I think, those people who said that climate change is not happening at all think that more than a third of something that isn't happening is attributable to human activity. And we see these conflicts of accounts in other responses to our questions, such as who is responsible for responding to climate change, where a lot of people, despite they think it's, it's um, despite the fact that, that they don't think that climate change is a, is, a, is a phenomenon that's occurring, still will rate industry and big polluting emitters as highly responsible for responding to climate change. So what this suggests to us uh, is that those opinions are not really reflective of a, an evidence-based process of a statement of reality about the world. They have some sort of function for the individual. And that might be a social function to signal, um, to signal to other people, I'm like you, or it might be a psychological function as well. And these kinds of conflicts of accounts has generated, I think, 
uh, an increasing amount of interest from psychologists to understand what kind of processes are going over uh, going on here. And I'm going to talk more about functions in uh, the, what I mean by functions in the next section. But I think um, this might be a good time to pause for some questions. Indeed, it is. Hey, Zoe, that's great. You've um, done a beautiful job there. You know, not only collecting the data but presenting it in a really um, easy to understand manner. So, thank you. So, we do have a few questions. So, I'll start with. Um, so, how stable are people's opinions about the causes of climate change? So, like, has it changed over the years that you've been collecting this data? Uh, because we, sorry, I just knocked my headset off. Uh, because we've got that longitudinal data set with people, we can track individuals over time to see whether they change. Um, so what we find is that there are small shifts in those, in those pie chart proportions, but they, they generally are statistically meaningless. The, um, the, the shifts are very small. So on aggregate, the population um, doesn't shift proportionally. However, when we look at fluctuation uh, between individuals, uh, we find that there's a lot of stuff going on. Roughly about a quarter of people will shift their response uh, from one survey to the next. Uh, and because that's kind of a bit of random shifting, uh, it doesn't change the aggregate proportions, if you, if you know what I mean. But there is a lot of within sample fluctuation. And when we try and link that back to uh, other changes, how, how are you more or less sure that climate change is happening? We don't find this, the associations we expect. Okay, thanks, Zoe. So you used four categories with the survey, and if you're quick, you could kind of flick back that to that for us, and I'll get you to go to another slide later on as well. Uh, so the question is, how about having a category for climate changes happening due to natural fluctuation as well as human causes? Uh, this is this is I think that's an excellent question, and it's uh, it's the category that everybody wants. And we've done a bit of um, testing to see what introducing that category uh, does. What we find is a lot of people um, gravitate towards that category if it's there, uh, but they're uh, those those people as a group. Um, uh, are no different to the people who select the, I think the climate change is happening and I think that humans are largely causing it. Um, uh, so it's, it's, this is what we would call a forced choice uh, question. So it forces people into a, a position statement, if you like. And we do find that it has higher, not to be too wordy, but higher criterion validity. We're able to pre predict things like behavior, policy support, and so on um, more accurately with this forced choice set up. OK. We've now got a dozen questions, so we're going to have to talk quickly. <laughs> so okay. if rapid change is disruptive, uh, is it not less important if it is natural or not or both? And more important, whether our activities can influence it so that it becomes less disruptive. Uh, is it not more? Is it? Is it not most important to define the potential for motivation for action? Uh, this, no, all there um, for you. <laughs> I think um, we might be able to answer that with some slides a bit later on. But um, what what we're finding too is that mitigation uh, behaviour is different than adaptation behaviour, and actually, what drives adaptation can be very different than what drives mitigate mitigation behaviour. Um, so yes, I, I think that, that, that that's a good question that in terms of adaptation, it doesn't matter what you think causes climate change. In terms of mitigation, yes, it does matter. OK, very good. Can you just find that high-low literacy graph again? Someone's asking if you could just explain it yep. one more time uh, and where the egalitarian group were more likely to undertake emissions reducing activities. Oh, were, I think is the question, were they, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if um, Kahan tested um, activity. Uh, this was just he was looking at a greater or lesser perceived threat from climate change. So it's, I think it's a good it's a, it's a, it's a good question to um, to ask if that would extend um, to climate relevant behaviour. 
Mm, okay. But I don't okay. know that this um, particular research addresses that. Sure. Now, of the 101 questions that you ask people, do, do you look at religious beliefs and their climate change belief? Uh, we did uh, initially in our 2010 survey. Uh, we didn't find any startling associations there. Uh, I think it's, uh, we were surprised that there were none. I think that, that um, you, there, I'm sure there's US research on this where um, religious associations play out more heavily, but it doesn't seem to be a striking feature of, um, of Australian attitudes. Okay, I'll just ask one more question. Uh, could people who think climate change is not happening say that it is human induced because it's something made up by people? It's, it's, it's possible that that's a misinterpretation, that, that it's open to misinterpretation because of that. Um, and it's also possible that people who don't think that climate change is happening will worry about it and have a lot of concern about it because of the potential for disruption that uh, adaptation policies might, might, might bring in. So yeah, there is, I mean, as, as with any questions, it's, it's, they're faulty. <laughs> and uh, the only way around that, that measurement error is to ask multiple questions to kind of smooth out those, those little errors in individual questions. Great. Now, I can see some of the future questions uh, relating to material you're about to cover. So how about you move on to the next section? Thanks, Zoe. Okay, great. Okay, so functions. What do we mean by functional responses? Um, before we before we launch into functions, uh, it's, it it might be instructive to to look at a few um, phenomena that are, are fundamental in shaping uh, how people think and behave. And one of those um, is cognitive dissonance theory, or has relevance to cognitive dissonance theory. But it's our strive for consistency, and this is particularly so in in Western cultures. I might add. Um, so we strive for consistency both in our own self-identity, but we also want to appear consistent to others. Um, you could argue that in countries like Australia and, uh, and the US and very individualistic countries that there is nothing so worse as being a hypocrite. One can't be hypocritical. And so cognitive dissonance theory um, talks to this striving and, and it proposes that if we have an attitude that is inconsistent somehow with a behavior, it causes a state of dissonance or discomfort. We don't like it and we strive to rectify it. So let's say we selected, uh, yes, I think that climate change is happening and, and where our activities are responsible for it, and yet it's somehow we, we, we become aware that we're actually not doing a lot to reduce our own footprint. This should cause a little bit of dissonance in you, especially if climate change is something important to your self-identity. And so what we can do is change our behavior. That's the hardest option. We can change our attitudes to align with our behavior, or we can introduce a third cognition. So that third cognition then reduces the dissonance. So in that example that I used, uh, a cognition might be an attitude that excuses inaction by saying, well, I can't do anything about it anyway, and it's not my problem. It's something for big businesses to deal with. So just an example of that process. Also, uh, when we learn about a new phenomena or uh, phenomenon, sorry, or are presented with a new stimulus, we often refer to our existing values to know how to think, feel, and behave about it. Especially if we're really uncertain about a stimulus, if it's really complex, intangible, etc. And climate change seems to tick all those boxes. So if we're making a decision about what to do in response to climate change. Um, the route often taken is to refer to what we know already, refer to our already well-developed and firmly held uh, sets of values and so on. And we can think of these, uh, these values as our ideologies, if you like. And just getting back to, getting back to functions, um, Opinions about climate change, and especially signaling those opinions about climate change, has a value expressive function. And value expression is very important. Uh, being social creatures, we like to signal to other people, hey, I'm like you. I think this way. You'll, um, I'm not one of those people. And an, a, an example of potentially some value expressive functions emerging in climate change 
is a little collection of, of placards from various climate change rallies, including, uh, including anti-carbon um, pricing rallies, pro-climate change rallies, uh, and so on, uh, that often I think that the, you can detect some of this value expression within the content of the signs. It's not necessarily uh, climate change based or climate change centric, these signs, but climate change is, it, if you like, the vehicle for being able to express a whole range of other values and uh, views about how society should operate that are really important for people. And so some of those signs are pretty provocative. Um, and even any layperson could speculate about the bearers of those signs. So what might we guess about these people? Well, we might be able to say which opinion team um, those people fall under. Uh, what about demographics? Is it, you know, is this an angry white male phenomenon or something? Uh, but what we find with demographics is even though um, we would like to think that um, the climate denial movement, if you like, is overpopulated with angry white males, when we look at the demographics, they're not particularly telling in terms of um, people's attitudes towards climate change. They're surprisingly small and they pale into insignificance when compared to other associations. So what about this person's ideology? We know it's political, right? Um, and it's a fair question to ask it's all, if, if it's all political because what we do see is really quite telling associations between what people think causes climate change and who people vote for. Uh, so you can see I've circled people who vote for the Greens Party. They um, are heavily populated by people who also fall into that hum happening and human-induced um, category. Uh, similarly for the Labour Party, whereas the Liberal and National Party voters um, are reversed. So that is hard to ignore because the effect is so big. However, it's a little bit dangerous to go down that path because if we are in the business of changing people's opinions, we certainly don't want to do it by telling people, <laughs> telling people how to vote. Um, the other thing is, the other issue is that people aren't going to the ballot boxes, not all people are going to the ballot boxes thinking about climate change and basing their voting opinion on that. People vote for a myriad of reasons and environmental might be just one among lots of competing uh, claims for importance. So what are political preference based on? What are these underlying values? Is there something underlying that's being tapped into here? Uh, and we come back to this idea, uh, idea of ideologies. Um, now, people's ideologies and their political preferences don't really map on one for one, but they are strongly associated. So we investigated some of these ideologies that might be behind or underlie that, that association we see with voting. So another um, possible sort people might have implicitly or explicitly when answering that categorical question is, is it consistent with my other values? And here I'm going to revert back to a little bit of um, psychological theory. So we used something called system justification theory to explore this idea of the influence of ideologies. So system justification theory states that individuals are, to a greater or lesser extent, motivated to, to fend prevailing systems, so economic and social systems, or the status quo, including inequitable systems, and to see their outcomes as moral, just, and fair. So we all have this tendency. Um, in some people, the tendency is stronger than others, and it's more important in shaping their opinions. And it doesn't matter, I think it's a good point to, to mention, uh, it's the prevailing system. Uh, so whether you live in a Western democracy or, a, um, or a, under a, a, a communist um, structure, the tendency is to defend the status quo. And what we liked about this system justification theory is it specifies a function. And this is a bit wordy, but it has an intrapsychic palliative effect, which is a fancy way of saying it makes us feel better. Uh, especially if we are a, a, an impoverished person that is maybe um, not doing so well under the prevailing system, um, it is 
easier in some regard, in a, in, in, a, in a psychological regard, to say, well, I was just a bit unlucky, uh, it's not the system's fault. Rather, it, that's easier in some ways than to carry around the angst uh, and helplessness of saying, well, I am the product of an inherently unfair system. And this system justification tendency is heightened under conditions of uncertainty or when prevailing systems come under threat. And arguably, climate change is a perfect storm for that to happen. So we looked at uh, three system justifying ide ideologies. Sorry for the wordy slide. So the first is economic system justification. So we, we uh, measured this with a series of statements that taps into people's tendency to view economic inequality as natural, inevitable, and legitimate, and to view economic outcomes as fair and deserved. And we looked at social dominance orientation, which is more about how people relate to others. So if you're high, if you have a high social dominance orientation, you preference relationships that are hierarchical rather than equal, and you advocate for the right of more powerful groups to dominate weaker groups. And finally, we looked at right-wing authoritarianism, which is people higher in right-wing authoritarianism advocate advocates for conventional traditions and established authorities and value of and value traditional beliefs, morality and lifestyle. And anybody who watches or has watched American Dad, he's your classic uh, right wing authoritarianist. Um, and we looked at people at the relationship between these ideologies and people's behaviour, um, their opinions about climate change and their support for policies designed to reduce uh, climate change emissions. And we found that uh, these ideologies explained opinions, behavior, and policy support above and beyond political voting behavior. So it's not necessarily who we vote for, but it's why we vote for them in the first place. And I might stop again for any questions. And we do indeed have a bunch of questions. So the first one is um, about the methodology. So you talked about the 5,000. So how did you select the 5,000 people? And if people are self-selecting into this research, then wouldn't that create some bias? Uh, to, that's a really good question. Um, yes, it would create some bias. So what we use is we use a, a, a group called the Online Research Unit. And they have a panel of people, so they have 300,000 people across Australia and New Zealand who have signed up to do surveys. And uh, they also do a whole lot of uh, personality typing and so on and so forth to make sure that, that when, when they ask these people to do a survey on behalf of CSIRO or something, that, that, that they can get um, people who uh, is a, an eclectic mix as they can find. They also get the people who say, yes, I want to do these surveys, um, receive small shopping credits. Um, and it's, it's, so there is an incentive for them to do it. And in some ways, that reduces, um, the, well, I think it significantly reduces the self-selection bias that would be inherent if people were just answering it out of concern for the environment, for instance. Um, there'll always be a little self-selection bias, I agree, but I think uh, by giving people small incentives to, to, um, to um, in exchange for doing the survey, we can reduce that. Sure, okay. Uh, so what is the data for primary producers as a segment of the survey? Primary producers, uh, we would get, I would have to get back to you. We do have data on using the ABS categories of people's, um, what industry people are involved in. I'm not sure what the numbers would be. Uh, but can it, I could get back to the, the, the questioner yeah, on that, that with the figures. Yeah, that's fine. And, and I'll invite everyone at the end um, that will uh, distribute your email address, your contact details at the end, so people can follow up with you with um, more sure. detailed questions that they'd like answered. So at the moment, I'm just cherry picking the ones that I think will be of most value to the whole audience. So here's a good one for you. Do responses change after, say, a particularly hot period of weather? <laughs> uh, we, um, unfortunately, we don't. We haven't collected the data uh, to analyse that. Um, but 
in, in, in some respects we don't need to because um, our friends in the US have done this for us uh, where they have linked attitudes to the temperature. Um, so if they, they, if they undertook a national survey uh, and they also recorded the temperature uh, in the place that the person answered the question and they found that it was directly linked. People, people were more concerned about climate change if it was hotter um, than it should be for that time of year in their regions. So we haven't done it, but uh, there are multiple studies now that link um, yeah, local weather with climate change responses. Mm, okay. And the last question for this segment, are those who identify with climate change occurring due to natural fluctuations as likely to act or support action to adapt and or mitigate as those who identify with human-induced climate change? Uh, no. Um, so they fall on, on all of those points. They fall roughly between what we might call the outright deniers, um, so people who don't think climate change is happening, and people who think it's happening for human reasons. Um, so they fall somewhere in between that. However, I would say that there is a lot of um, there's a lot of variation within those groups. So you get some people who think um, that climate change is just natural, and yet they're star performers. You know, they're they're doing everything they can to reduce their emissions. They support um, they support policies designed to reduce emissions and so on. They're doing everything right. Um, so they have the wrong in inverted commas attitude, but they're outperforming people who have the so-called right attitudes. So there's exceptions to the rule everywhere, but on mm, aggregate. Level. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Zoe. I know you've got a lot to get through, so I'll let you move on. Okay. Sorry. Last point. Okay. What are we up to? Okay. So another thought that might be going on implicitly or explicitly is what is everybody else going to pick? I think that this question is possibly a bit more um, prominent in the minds of if I were to ask a group of uh, undergraduates, which I have, I want you to raise your hands, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, um, that you see the nervous furtive glances immediately. Uh, and that's not a bad thing, that's natural. I mean, we are, we are really, we're social animals. Well, a few, a few thyroid I don't think you'd describe as social animals, but by and large we are. It's important what other people think. So to answer this question or explore this question, immediately after in our survey we asked that basic categorical question, we asked people this. Using those same four statements, what percentage of the Australian population do you think would fall into each category? So we've got those four categories again, and what people had to do was put a percentage point next to each of those categories, and they weren't allowed to move forward until that, that total that totaled 100%. So I'm gonna, uh, this, I'm gonna go back to using 2010 data, which why this won't match up with the first pie chart I, sh I showed you, but, uh, n but nevertheless. So the darker bars represent what we found in 2010. So that first category, I don't think climate change is happening. In 2010, 6% of the, the, our population of respondents selected that. However, on average, people thought that a roughly 22% of Australians would fall into this category. The same for people who didn't know, even though they comprised a very small percentage of what people actually selected, People estimated that the Australian public was a lot more unsure than they actually were. With the natural and the human-induced categories, those two last categories, we actually see uh, an underestimation of how many Australians would feel that way. But I think the, the striking one, so uh, in 2010, we had half our respondents selecting that they thought it was happening and human-induced. But everybody saw only about well, on average, people thought about a third of Australians would select that option. But I think the, the, the striking one is the overestimation of people in that first category of what we might term denial. I don't think climate change is happening. I think that's a striking overestimation. So then we thought, okay, let's break these down by groups. Let's take, you know, the red team, these people who said climate change is not happening, and look at their estimations of what Australia's thinking. So we're just looking at the, the people in those groups 
what do they think the rest of Australia is thinking? And here you can see that dotted line represents the actual, so it's at 6% or 7, roughly fluctuates between 6 and 7%. On average, these people estimate that half of Australia thinks like that. That's quite striking. If we take those people who select the don't know option and look at what they think the rest of Australia thinks, again, we see that they comprise only 4% of the population, but they think that about a third of Australians would agree with them. With the people who select that happening but natural thing, they actually underestimate the amount of Australians who would agree with them, as do this last category of human induced. You can see the dotted line above um, that, so that represents 50% of our respondents thinking like that. They think about 40% of Australians would think like them. But in every case, people thought that their own opinion would be the most common opinion in Australia. Uh, this is a classic case, I think, of what's known in social psychology as the false consensus effect. So this is the tendency amongst individuals and groups to overestimate how common one's own opinion is. Uh, it's a very stable effect and it happens in lots and lots of domains. So why does it happen? And there are two competing theories as to why it happens. And one is what's termed the availability heuristic. So if you're casting, if someone asks you a question, what do you think the Australians think about this? You're casting around, scratching your head going, oh, I don't really know. The people who are most likely to come to mind are the people that you hang out with. So your friends, your family, and so on. And the people that we hang out with often are much closer um, to us in terms of their own values, their own sets of opinions, etc. We hang out with people who are, who are like us, largely. Uh, a, 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 competing, a competing theory says that that's all very well and good, but it doesn't explain um, particular patterns of false consensus. It doesn't explain, for instance, why that deny group had a massive false consensus effect compared to the other groups. Uh, and they say it functions, the false consensus effect operates because it provides social support, uh, especially in cases where we think that our views might not be popular or they might in some way be unpalatable. So for instance, you see the biggest false consensus effect occur uh, when you ask questions about um, racism or gender discrimination and so on. Uh, so in instances where there is a sneaking suspicion, perhaps, that one's uh, either expressing an unpopular opinion or a politically incorrect opinion, um, there can, it, these people argue, uh, um, be this need, greater need for social support which boosts our consensus estimates. And lastly, what do the people I respect think? Um, as I said, I'm not a climate scientist. I don't have time to devote um, to the to the nitty gritty of really understanding well and truly um, whether it's occurring or not. And just to show my, I think that I should, perhaps I should have started with this. If somebody um, asked me the question, which would I select? And I think it would be dependent on the day. Day. It, most times I would um, do the green box, it's largely caused by humans, but I think almost just as often I would pick the I don't know box, particularly if I was in a somewhat existential mood. Um, but I'm just going to divert again to theory here of what, the, what do the people I respect think, and talk about um, social identity theory and self-categorization theory, which both theorize that we look to significant others and we can call these people our social reference to know how to think, feel, and behave, especially when we're approached with new and complex information. Um, so these social reference might be close personal associates, it might be a spouse, it might be a, um, another family member or a friend, or respected people in positions of authority, famous people. So we were interested in establishing, okay, who are people's social reference? If you don't want to do the hard work of really down and sitting down and thinking about it and nothing it out, um, who are people's shorthands? Uh, and one of the ways we investigated this is to start off our, each survey with the question, which three people first come to mind when you think about climate change? So we, by this we're trying to establish people's um, personal 
association so there's all automatic it's sort of like an automatic referent if you, if you would now you're going to have to cast your mind back to 2010 um, when the political landscape was a bit different than we we um we had today and our first most popular um, answer to this question uh, was the Prime Minister of the country. Do you remember those days? Okay, the second most common response to this question when we asked people back in 2010 was Al Gore. The next was Julia Gillard, who I, from memory, was Deputy PM at the time. Penny Wong was fourth, who at the time, I think, had the climate change portfolio. Then Senator Bob Brown. Then the leader of the opposition, I think, although it might have been Malcolm Turnbull, someone can correct me, July, August 2010. Then we had Peter Garrett, who's the, uh, who, who held the environmental portfolio. So our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seven most common associations were politicians, and six of them were domestic uh, politicians. Only then <laughs> do we start to see a non-politician emerge. And so these are people who think, well, I think about myself. Some people would say, I think about myself, my future. Then, well, we kind of get scientists, paleontologists, but at least it's a scientist. Uh, Tim, Tim Flannery, and then we're back to politicians again. And then we had to aggregate a whole lot of kind of different groups just to get it on the leaderboard of people who said family. I think about my family. I think about children. I think about my little pets, my poor pets. We thought that children, this really surprised us because we thought children, family, and so on would be much more salient in people's minds when they're thinking about climate change. So overall, if we crunch the numbers all of all those responses, 55% of people's responses were politicians. Only 8% referred to the self or family. There's a big other category. Uh, only 5% selected a scientist or scientists in general. That's, well, depending on your point of view, I think that's rather depressing. Um, but so it seems that our automatic authority reference seem to be more important than personal reference, and they're more often political leaders than scientists. Uh, uh, I just had to add in this slide because we added a question um, this year where we gave people categories um, after they, they talked about their opinions on climate change. We go, what do you base your opinion on? And we gave them these options, uh, which were drawn from the most common options of the same open-ended question that we gave last year. Uh, friends and family don't get a look in. Um, only 2.2% say that they base their opinions on them. That's not good news for the availability here. So that really goes against that theoretically. And sim similarly, only 2.2% were willing to concede uh, that politicians and government were important in their response formulation. Uh, the bulk said scientific research and common sense. Uh, even though it's not science or scientists that come to mind automatically. So to conclude, how can this information help? Well, I think that this information is important in terms of informing how climate change can be framed. Um, so we know that technical information won't necessarily lead to opinion and behavior change. That deficit model uh, I know there will be plenty of people that disagree with me, but I reckon we, we should chuck it out. Uh, I think it, it, it has the potential to entrench uh, opinions that are counter to the scientific evidence. And I, do, and it, I, I think it has the danger of being a bit patronizing. Uh, people aren't stupid, and if you bang them over the head with a deficit model approach, they'll think you're calling them stupid. And generally, nobody likes to be called stupid. Find out what's important to people. If we ask these people in a vacuum, which we have, you know, do you think climate change is important? Even if they don't think it's happening, they think it's important. They think it's an important social issue. However, when we ask them to rank the importance of climate change in relation to a whole lot of other things like education, job security, employment, health, 
climate change does really poorly. It goes right down the list, which tells us that, yeah, it's important, but there's a whole lot of stuff that's more important for people. And that idea of values, how do we appeal to those multiple underlying ideologies, etc., at the same time? And how do we stop triggering those impeding values, things like social dominance, orientation, and so on? And just finally, I think that there's an, a lesson from some of that, um, those faulty estimates of public opinion. Uh, I think that, th that we need to make people aware of the real consensus, uh, not the imagined one. And I think I might conclude there, John. Excellent. Thanks for that, Zoe. And I can see your contact details there now too, which is just great. So folks, the focus of this webinar series is all about enabling change. So it's about um, behaviour and that sort of thing. So I'm just going to pick out a few questions regarding that now. So, Zoe, how can people be encouraged to understand that they're in denial uh, of scientific reality and move on, asks one of our people. Uh, it's, it's really, it's, it, that's, it's kind of, um, that challenge is like performing mass psychoanalysis on the population. It's probably uh, not going to happen, but there are ways that you can change people's attitudes through structural change. Uh, so that's, that's top-down approaches uh, are good as well. Um, and if you if you regulate to make certain behaviours more easy to perform, um, this can have it speaks to another psychological theory actually. If you um, encourage behaviour change rather than attitude change. Um, you can influence attitudes as well. So it's not necessary to have the right attitudes to change your behaviour. If you design um, structural changes to make people, uh, to make certain behaviours more easy for people, uh, there's this weird, tricky little psychology stuff that goes on where people observe, it's called self-perception theory. People define their attitudes if they're not particularly well defined by monitoring their behaviour. And so if you find yourself cycling to work because there's a beautiful bike path, um, network of bike, bike paths, and you know that you associate that with a, a, a being an environmentally act friendly activity, uh, you're more likely to say, well, maybe that's the kind of person I am, you know, I'm just a little bit green. So I think you can have bottom-up approaches whereby you can psychoanalyze, <laughs> perform, have psychoanalysis sessions with, with every single individual, but I think you can have a top-down approach that's that's effective as well.